Welcome to another episode of In The Zone. I am your host, Chris Broussard, and we have a terrific show for you today. We are going to interview Mike Wise, a longtime NBA writer with the New York Times, Washington Post, now the undefeated. We'll get some great stories out of Mike Wise. Look, not down Jay. I hate to tell you, I knocked down Jay too hard. He had to take a break. He couldn't make it in this week. He's on vacation with his family in Hawaii, resting up getting his wounds healed up from getting beat down too much on Knockdown Jay. But we'll get him back here in a few weeks. And of course, as always, we are going to start the show with my top five. So look, we're about to start the second half of the NBA season. So of course, the logical top five is what are the biggest five storylines of the second half of the season? At number five, Joel Embiid's health. That's right, it's a huge story for several reasons. Look, he is the best big man in basketball. That's right, I said it. Joel Embiid's the best big man in basketball, but the question is, can the brother stay healthy? He is beginning to play in back-to-back games, which is great, but will he be able to stay on the floor consistently through the remainder of the season? At number four, Oklahoma City and their improved play. Look, they've been up and down all season long. They caught fire in mid-December, went 18 and six over their next 24 games. Then they lost six of nine. So they're kind of a roller coaster ride, but I kind of like what I see because when it's time to turn it up, they turn it up to the max. They're two and zero against Golden State. 2-1 against Houston, and the big question, of course, the big storyline is can they play well enough together to keep Paul George in Oklahoma for at least one more season? Remember, he doesn't have to opt out. He can stay there for one more year and play with Russell Westbrook. At number three, Kawhi Leonard and the San Antonio Spurs. This is usually drama-free territory down in the Alamo, but no, not anymore. Greg Popovich came out and said he would be surprised if Kawhi Leonard played at all the remainder of the regular season. That is stunning. I mean, that he'd be shocked if Kawhi comes back. Look, he is out indefinitely with this mysterious quad injury, but here's what's going on. The Spurs, they'll tell you that Kawhi They think he just doesn't want to get on the floor unless he is absolutely, positively, 100% healthy. And that goes way back beyond the quad injury. That's just how Kawhi's been throughout his career. Kawhi, on the other hand, feels like, why are you pushing me to get out on the floor when I'm not yet ready? You pushed me in the first half of the season, and you saw what happened. After nine games, I had to shut it back down. So stop sweating me like I'm just sitting out because I don't want to play when really I'm still injured. At number two. You know we had to get to Lonzo Ball, LeVar Ball, and I'm going to add somebody else in. Isaiah Thomas, IT4. Look, the Lakers were rolling without Lonzo or IT, playing their best ball of the season when Lonzo's on the bench. Then they trade for IT. They're riding a four-game win streak. IT gets in there, got his powers back, drops 22 in game one, but oh, they lost. And they lost again. And then they lost again. They're on a three-game losing streak since Isaiah Thomas is back. My question is how will Isaiah and Lonzo work together? Lonzo's supposed to be back in the second half of the season. So how does Isaiah's presence impact Lonzo Ball? We know he's the point guard of the future, but Isaiah's trying to impress. He's trying to shine so he can get that big contract this summer. So it's going to be interesting to see how those two work together, even if they're not on the floor together. And number one, speaking of LeBron James, the Cleveland Cavaliers improvement. I love the trades that they made. I loved them even before they went out and beat Boston and Oklahoma City. But I love the fit of these new players that they have. So the question is, the number one storyline is, can they improve to the degree that they can challenge the Golden State Warriors. The question is not, will they win the East? I'm telling you, they will roll through the East. But can they challenge Golden State? Give them at least a tough six-game series. And who knows? The Warriors are 
not looking like they used to look right now, maybe Cavs, the Cavs and LeBron can pull off the upset. If the Cavs do play well, do push Golden State, who knows, maybe upset Golden State. You would think LeBron James would just stay in Cleveland and try to keep winning in his hometown or his home region of Northeast Ohio. So keep an eye on the number one storyline, the Cavaliers' improvement over these final 20-some-odd games. All right, guys, now look, did I miss anything? I hit you with five, I threw out Hayward as well. You may have other stories, though, that you think we should keep an eye on in the second half of the NBA season. So tell them to me in the comments. Type them in there. We will look at them, and then you never know. We might address you on In The Zone. <laughs> All right, here we are with a man that I go way back with, Mike Wise. We worked together at the New York Times, but we met in 1996 at the San Antonio, the, the All-Star Game in San Antonio. Yes, and you were at the Akron Beacon Journal yep, at the time. Covering the Cavaliers. And we and we, we forged a bond through basketball, actually playing basketball <laughs> when, I, when I could, and I think Chris still does. But yeah, yeah. You we had, had some, a nice some, game though, man. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, thank I'm you. telling people, don't sleep on you. Yeah, on no, the a court. lot of people, uh, they, they consider it like McKeskey slash Thrawn Bradley. Um, <laughs> and you have to go back for that reference. But yeah, we had some good competitive media games. Remember we met, those? I remember we met, I think it was Trinity College in yeah. San Antonio. Yes. I just happened, to, it was my first All Star game, first year on the beat. I just happened to see a flyer that there's like a media run at Trinity right. College Saturday morning. I ain't know any media hardly. And I, I show up and you, Sean Powell, who's now with NBA.com, was Stein, Matt Steinmetz, I'm sure he was there. Yeah, in. Curtis Bunn. Uh, Bunn, Bro Bun, I never played with Bunn. Uh, Rick, but you, Rick I Tellender? He, Tellender yeah. I've played with, but he wasn't at that yeah. one. Bunn I heard with Dunk. Bunn used to cover the Knicks for the Yeah, He, he yeah, was he dunking in games yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. And Stephen A. would show up occasionally, too, and literally you would not see the ball for, like, <laughs> I'm talking 20 minutes. Can, can Stephen A. hoop? I play with him. I want to I want to get your opinion. I mean, hoop is like a uh, – that's a pejorative. I don't know what you would call that, what he does. He shoot. <laughs> look, if he plays in a real competitive game with guys who play D now, he can shoot a little bit. He can shoot. He can shoot a little bit of it. Shoot. And, you know, but, uh, look, there was some guy from Washington um, – I don't even remember him. Tom Knott. Remember the guy? He had I heard, like I heard of him. He, he had he like bags sweet. under his eyes. He looked like basically he crawled out of a crypt. And this guy <laughs> shut Stephen A down and it killed him. And I don't care. Really? Oh, oh, Stephen A was the, the greatest moment about Stephen A was when Rick Tellender used a page of the Chicago Sun Times to say who were the best I media players. That. And Stephen A made third team, Chris, and he shouted at him across the United Center media room. And everybody looked back at him and said, You got third team because you don't pass. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. For people that don't, yeah. that was during the NBA Finals. 1998 or Rick Tellender, yeah. yep, for yeah. the Chicago yeah. Sun Times, writes a column. And he has a first team, second team, third team, all and this, media, and pictures and everything. And the, to this moment, like, nobody read that page except, except the media <laughs> and their moms. Exactly. It's like, Mom, I'm, I'm 35. I'm in the paper for playing basketball against right. guys that can't, you know, they measure their verticals with Metro cards. I mean, it was crazy. I think I cut it out and fa framed it. Me yeah. and you made first team. Yes, we did. Me, you, uh, Kirkjian. Tim Kirkchin. Tim Kirkchin. Yeah, I never played team. with him, but I heard he was really yeah, good. Yeah, I didn't either. Uh, Cherry Bembry made uh, the, second team second, only because Buker he, made, he, Buker was upset. Rick Buker because yeah, he Buker. made second team. Yeah, Buker. Which yeah. was right. I think that was appropriate. Rick, Rick, Rick he Buker, wasn't first team. Rick Buker, if it was an exercise class, like an aerobicize class, he would have been first team. Yes, he runs like I without agree. a chicken, without a head. You never know I where agree. he move. He moves He's like Reggie Miller, but in, in front, should, unfortunately, he shot like Chris Dudley. So he. <laughs> He, he was he was a marathoner. Yes, but no, I heard Tom Knott was tremendous. Yes, um, but yeah, that, those were good times, man. We go way back, had some knockdown, drag out games, and you you have covered. When did you start covering the NBA? Uh, I want to say ninety four. I mean, I, okay. I had done it as a backup beat writer at this paper that went out of business in Sacramento, the Sacramento Union, 
and it was uh, we had this guy. His name was Don Drysdale. No relation to the pitcher, wow. but he was a great beat writer. And he like let me you know tag along with him, and I would do I would get to do um, sidebars at the games at Arco Arena, and, and I was like, I want to do this. And paper went out of business. Got a job copy editing at the San Jose Mercury News, and then talked my way into the New York Times and covering the New Jersey Nets. Wow! Uh, so it was uh, that that was sort of. When I went to New York in 94, it was like a, uh, it, not only a professional validation, but it was like a personal validation. Yeah, like, yeah. like, look at you, homecoming queen. Look at me now. <laughs> I got a Times job. <laughs> that but, was uh, our New but, York Times. Then you moved on eventually to the Washington Post. Yeah, they, gave, they offered me a column in 2004. I worked there for 11 years. And uh, it's a, like, I, I, I think it was my favorite place in terms of just finding my voice and being yeah. able to say what I wanted to say. And then I took a job with ESPN's Undefeated in 2015. Okay. So yeah, great, I've been great. there for three years. So 94, you start covering the NBA. You covered, you were there for the Michael Jordan's, some of his greatest years. Yeah, it was amazing. Um, I was spoiled. And, and playing the Knicks, playing against those Knicks teams. Yep. Um, I was there for the 55-point night. Oh, but when he came back, yes. that's right, his second, from his Incredible. second retirement. So I'm going to ask you, because the big debate is always who's better, LeBron yeah. or, or Jordan. You've seen both up close. What's your take? If, you, if LeBron stopped his career today, I would have to put Michael Jordan number one. Okay. If LeBron James plays five more years and wins one or two more titles, I don't think there's a question. Uh, who's number one with the longevity? With um, he probably will play four or five more years yeah, and, at a high level. And I'm not gonna, you know, look. Uh, every, Michael always talked about the love of the game. Yeah. Okay, the love of the game to me is never retiring to go play baseball. I mean, I understand you're exhausted. I mean, I know the the media demands were incredible. The love of the game. LeBron James has shown just as much or more love of the game as Michael Jordan, and oh, no I love question. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan will always be in most players' hearts, uh, most people's hearts who saw him the greatest player because of his dynamic, you know, dynam <laughs> dynamic way he played. And, yeah. and he, was, he was powerful, but he was graceful. And yes. I, in a weird way, I think LeBron James, I don't know if you agree with me this, Chris, I think LeBron James is handicapped a little because he's so big and strong. It's like he's like, Arr. he's not as graceful. Yeah, like, yeah. like it's just a big bull going yep. to the rim and it's dunking and it's and he's not as graceful. And yet he's a better playmaker. He yep. he's a he's a better passer. Um, I he's not a better defender. But he's a but he's a very good defender. Yep. Yep. And yep. Uh, one of the best in the league. And so I look at LeBron James as, you know, I mean, when he said make room on Mount Rushmore, to me he's already there. Yeah, I have him I the like second to, best ever yes, behind Jordan. I believe, I'm with you. I yeah. believe him. And then, you know, you could, if you wanted to go centers, Kareem, Russell, if you wanted to yeah. go guards, you could go, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bird. Uh, I'm sorry, forwards, you go Bird. Uh, I, Magic, I don't know about you. If I started a team today, just because uh, I, I fell in love with basketball the most during the 80s, I'd still take Magic to start a team. Really? Because you give it up to everybody. He, yeah, especially if you're taking a bunch of stars. Yeah. He would be like the perfect playmaker for a bunch of stars. Because yeah. Magic didn't care about if he had two points or 22 points. Yeah, and then and then, and then then your next pick is going to be LeBron or Jordan. You yeah. can't go wrong. Nah, it, so Magic would, would be yeah, great if you, if to you, have. So, uh, but that's, you know, that. but yeah, I think 1A and 1B, and LeBron is right. He's on my Mount Rushmore players now, and uh, and it's amazing because I've never seen a guy get more grief that's on a Mount Rushmore yeah, player. Yeah, right. Well, you mentioned, and again, you were covering the league hard, intensely at this point. Jordan, uh, when he when he first retired, actually you weren't covering the league at that point. But when he first retired, he was burnt out after winning the three yes, championships. He was. And I've said that it's difficult for teams to make four straight finals, let alone individuals. And LeBron has made seven straight. And as much as intense as the media scrutiny was on Jordan. It was nothing compared to what LeBron James goes through. Oh, so I do think Jordan's better, but I think LeBron needs to be given credit. And one thing he's done better than Jordan is handle the scrutiny. He hasn't gotten burnt out 
from the, the social media scrutiny, the media coverage, going to seven straight finals and things and like that. I, I, I'm almost, uh, I, Michael Jordan should get on his knees and say his blessings every day that there wasn't social media during his time. Hmm. Because he had some of his own personal foibles off the court that we didn't find out until about labor later, and most of them involved infidelities that were widely reported. Um, look, so did Tiger Woods, but yep, yep, uh, but, yep, yep. but you could say um, the, it blew like, up in Tiger it, Woods. Yeah, it blew up in Tiger Woods's face, and and if Jordan had lived, if Jordan had played in that in this era. Um, and this is the thing about LeBron. I never get the LeBron hate. I guess you could if you were a fan of an opposing team and he just dunked on your season every year. <laughs> I could get that. But what I can't get is this guy that you've never seen a mugshot of him anywhere. You, he doesn't have any criminal record. He's a, his biggest flaw is how he's handled departures from where he's at. That's mm -hmm. it. Yep, yep, I mean, that's yep. the, And so I can't, I don't know, I just, I, I, I'm always blown away by the criticism that befalls LeBron James. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting. Personally, off the court. Yeah, no, I, I, obviously the guy in this era to stay squeaky clean off the court mm -hmm is incredible. Um, something with LeBron, you know, this weekend, uh, yeah. Laura Ingram, you, you're talking about yeah, criticism I've never heard of, of him. Her. No, I'm not. <laughs> what, I'm what was your take on that whole episode where she says shut up and dribble, basically, to LeBron for talking about Donald Trump? Yeah, well, one, I, look, as you know now, polarization makes you popular in this country. Yep. It didn't used to. Before, you're like, oh, that person's a little edgy. <laughs> Nowadays, it's up. like, if you are pol if you got half the country hating you and half the country loving you, you've won. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think in that way, they both won this weekend because she appealed to her base. Yeah, he yeah, appealed yeah, to yeah. his. Um, the, the, the sad part of it to me is, and the hypocritical part of it to me on her, uh, on her platform is like we like me other conservative liberal pundits all over this country all we did is get on Michael Jordan Tiger Woods That's and right. others for not speaking out socially for That's not right. being closer to their neighborhood communities and being loyal to their sneaker co and apparel companies and their golf uh, driving companies before they were ever loyal to the things that we thought mattered in society yep. and we were trying to be the we were trying to be the social conscience compasses of sports and and now that these guys there's this renaissance of social conscious uh, athlete act activism and suddenly we want to tell them to shut up and dribble again. We want them to stick to sports. I, it doesn't work both ways. I feel it's incredibly hypocritical. Well, and, and, and if you're going to, if you're going to take him on and say that, you should take on people who agree with your views too, and tell them like, hey, exactly. if you if you essentially do not like what he said, but you agree with whoever Kurt Schilling's take on the president, then. Um, then you need to also say, Kirk, you're just a former athlete. That's right. What, I mean, Kirk, you're just a former athlete. What are you doing? And so, so, I, so that part of it bothers me a little bit. I also look. LeBron's, LeBron's put in an awkward situation, but he also he entered that arena once. Once he went there. Yep. You know, once, once you drop an f bomb on the president, I think there's a lot better ways to criticize any uh, leader of the free world than dropping the f bomb on him. Yeah, and I think I think what happens is. The president uses that type of language and, and did when he was running and, and was, you know, ripped people and criticized people. He, he doesn't have the decorum of a typical president. Huh. So now it's opened it up to people going to criticize him in the way he, he goes after other people. But you're right on Laura Ingram. I mean, she's had, she's told entertainers, shut up and sing. She's told athletes, obviously, shut up and dribble. But yet they'll have Kurt Schilling and other entertainers that agree with their yeah, take to on, on the network. So, uh, yeah, I, look, I love that LeBron, I love his more than an athlete uh, motto. Yeah. Because, you know, too many of the kids that look up to him, particularly young African-American boys, so, and I understand where they're coming from, but it's, it's not the way you want to go about it. Too many of them think it's NBA or NFL or bust, and there's nothing else they can do. Yeah. And so for him to come out and say, there's other things that you should be concerned about, other things you should be interested in as the greatest athlete in the world. I think that's tremendous. So um, he, he's handled it well. Um, and I, the the stick know. to sports thing, too, is I think it's dangerous because if you're going to say that, you know, if, if J.J. Watt hadn't raised all those that's millions right. – for the people in Houston, if shoot you and uh, people in your of your of your ilk and platform and athletes 
um, white, black, whatever, hadn't gone into schools and, in, and encouraged kids to be something more than they were, that, that too is beyond, you know, anybody, I think anybody that uses just their sport to, as a means to an yeah, end, yeah. financial wealth, individual security, that to me, there's something wrong with that. No, that's, I don't that's want them to shut up point. and dribble. That's I want them point. to be more than they are. Yep. I'm more than a sports writer. Yep. That's right. You are more right. than a TV host, but I am more than a sports writer. No, I'm <laughs> no that's, that's a great point. And, and that's the thing, like, people only want athletes not to speak out when they disagree with your view. You know, right. if, 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 the, if people agree with the, the athlete's take, then they want him to speak out as much as he can because we understand how much influence athletes and entertainers have on our culture. But when they speak out on something and they disagree with you, that's when people yeah. don't want to hear Tim, from them. Tim Thomas, the Boston Bruins goalie, um, when they when the Bruins won the Stanley Cup, refused to go to the White House because he did not believe in President Barack Obama's policies. And he was widely criticized. I didn't have a problem with it because it was his views. Yep. I didn't necessarily agree with his views, but if he wanted to express it that way. Yeah, yeah. I, I, and I still, I understand all these guys don't want to go to the White House. Um, I wouldn't, I just wouldn't, I'd go to the White House. I just wouldn't visit with the, you the leader with of the free world you if he didn't want around. to. <laughs> yeah. It's the 45 of the great, you know, of our president. It's like, it's the office. It's not just the person there. Yeah. Yeah, look, I, I mean, it, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with these, uh, the, the next few NBA and NFL champions as, you know, when they're invited to the White House or even how the president responds Oh, no, no, he's shutting that he, down. He, he's not having that, any that, of that, There's not going to be a no, ceremony no after, the <laughs> after the next person, after the next team uh, team declines his invitation. You know, it, it's, at yeah, some point it's going to be like he's going to have to invite high school teams. It's, um, <laughs> now, you, you also, when you covered the Knicks, you covered the New York Knicks for the New York Times, when Jeff Van Gundy was coaching. Yeah, yeah, that was like when I'm carbon dated from that already. Right, that right. was like so long ago. It was when the Knicks were good. That, that's what I was going to say. Like, you covered the Knicks when they were content. The last time they were contenders. Yeah. What do you think is wrong with this franchise? Why can't they become a good team anymore? Yeah, well, I don't want to go all Colin on you because he has some long metaphors. And, uh, and, but he, he always works the story around to something really funny. Yeah, yeah. But I'm telling you, like, there was one time in my life when I wasn't married and I was kind of like, I have dated some really bad women. And what is wrong with them? And, what are, and my friend told me one day, well, of these 15 bad relationships, <laughs> do you know that there's a common denominator? And yes, it was me. I was <laughs> the problem. Jim Dolan is the problem He's with the, the New York Knicks. He stained. He stained the reputations of Phil Jackson. Phil Jackson was the greatest coach in the history. Phil Jackson could have gone to heaven and basically, you know, laughed at Red Auerbach. <laughs> and now he's like, he worked for the Knicks, and now he's like, tainted goods. You go to work for the Knicks. Yep. You, you go to work or play for the Isaiah Thomas. Isaiah Thomas. Look. Larry Brown. Larry Brown's tainted. Drayton, Lenny Wilkins. Yes. Legends have gone to the garden and been and crumbled. Yes. No question about and it. And so, so, James uh, so, Dolan, so I, I just feel like if you got a toxic top-down management, and that management is afraid of whatever, a, a fear of uh, how something looks in the media, mm -hmm. and you don't have confidence to sort of delegate to one person and say, this is how we're going to run things, and, and it's a shark tank, and it's been a shark tank up there for a while, you know, it's not just bad luck at this point. I've seen the same thing with Washington and, uh, and its NFL owner, Dan Snyder. Mm -hmm. There is a common denominator that that team has not been back to um, a conference championship game since 1992. It's is, him. Is it owners? It's a, it's owners, and, owners and the people you put on top to run the thing. I was going to ask you, for, for fans and listeners that might say, well, how can the owner ruin a franchise? Mm -hmm. Is it owners being too hands-on and getting too involved and not just hiring good football and basketball people and letting them do their job? They always want to be involved? Yeah, I think that's part of it, Chris. I also think that, um, look, uh, when, when a former boss of ours, Neil Amder, went out and hired you, he had people from the Boston Globe and the Miami Herald and the LA Times knocking on his doorstep to hire an NBA writer for the New York Times. He saw something in you at the Akron Beacon Journal. He, you weren't the exotic candidate from yeah. abroad. You were in Ohio, <laughs> and he Coming and he cash. said and he. But he saw your <laughs> stories. He brought you in and he said, Broussard gets the game more than this guy." Like, I, yeah, he's 
in Akron, but I'm going to bring him to New York yeah, because yeah, I, yeah. so I think there's something to be said for ide identifying a young candidate that isn't the sexy moxie candidate from abroad that's not Phil that's Jackson, not Larry Brown. Like, go take a chance on a David Blatt and make him become a Hall of Famer. Mm -hmm. Eric Spolstra. Eric Spolstra is going to go into the Hall of Fame one day. Whatever you think coach. about Eric Spolstra, he will go into the Hall of Fame one day because, not because he worked for Pat Riley, because Pat Riley said, go coach. Go yeah. show me what you can do. Yeah. And so at some point, if, if a, and that goes the same for a GM too. This Kobe Altman guy, I met him. He just he, made, he was Dan Gilbert said, I don't ago. want to lose LeBron James. Please <laughs> do something. Kobe Altman looks like pretty, I would, if, if, Le, if, if the Cleveland Cavaliers win the title, if they even get back to the finals, he's my GM of the year. Yeah, that's a great, great call. He went from the worst GM. Got, even if oh, they don't win the worst, it. Yeah, He, he, he could, went from he the worst be. GM to the greatest GM. <laughs> well, speaking of that, what do you think LeBron – look, none of us know what I didn't even answer going. the question, by the way. Sorry about well, that. Well, you talked about the Knicks. You said yeah, the problem is the yeah, ownership. Yeah, I, I just think, yeah, what I guess my point, my roundabout point is you, it's okay to hire someone that isn't famous. Yeah. It's, if the most famous person – is carrying the clipboard on your uh, within your organization, or it's the owner. If that's the most famous person in your organization, you don't have a good franchise. The most famous <laughs> person has to be the player on the court. That's right. That's you know, right. So yeah, nah, that's that's. So look, LeBron. You mentioned Cavs getting to the finals. Uh, what do you think? None of us know what he's going to do yeah. this summer. What would you advise him to do if he came to you and said, "What should I do?" Let's say they get to the finals. Yes and lose to the Warriors in a competitive six-game series. Yes. What would you think? <sighs> a competitive six-game series? Yeah, like one that so makes you, don't you think feel maybe you don't, they might you don't be able to beat You don't them feel next like year. at the end of last year. Exactly. And you got nine, much okay. more competitive more, than last year. Much more competitive Where you look at it and say, you know what, with some growth, you're there. They you're might, there. Yeah, they're right there. I mean, I, uh, and I can, I can tell you what he's not going to do based on the people I've talked to, and you probably talked to the same people. LeBron James is, and I, I told Colin this too, LeBron James is not going to a team that um, he needs to recruit talent to. Yep. He's not going to any organ At this point in his career, he's not doing the Miami thing. He's not. He's going to a ready-made team that can get him over the Golden State Warriors, yep. that he believes can get him within, within a year, two years max, because he knows his time is fleeting. I don't, other than the Houston Rockets, I don't see that team in the Western Conference right now. Now, you could say if you're the Lakers and you put Paul George there and you put maybe, maybe you make it okay for him, but, but LeBron James is not pulling that deal. He's not if, putting that deal LeBron together. If LeBron and Paul went there, how good would they be next year, the Lakers? They wouldn't beat the Warriors. They'd be very yeah. good. I don't think they'd beat the Warriors. That's just me. Yeah. Le Lonzo Ball in three years, I think they beat the Warriors. Oh, so you like Lonzo Ball? I love Lonzo Ball. Really? So you he wouldn't... puts he puts the he puts that pass on kids on people's fingertips. If I'm a coach, I'm saying, uh, you know, we'll work on your shot. You're already <laughs> you're already making the game easier for people that don't even know how to run the floor. So, so if you're the Lakers, how would you deal with Levar Ball? Oh God, is that the, a problem or you just one. ignore it? Whoa. We went from LeBron to LeVar Ball real quick. <laughs> I, was, I, was talking, I was talking to someone who the Lakers have called this weekend, have called to ask how should we deal with LeVar Ball. Really? And they told him, the, this person told him, just ignore it. Treat him like any other parent. Don't, don't even address yeah, the things I don't he know. says. I'm not sure you can do that. Yeah, I don't know either. I, I, I'm more, uh, look, I, I come from a different I, I come from a different take on this whole thing in that Scott Brooks had a great line recently. They asked him about, um, you know, would you, what would you like if you had a father like yeah, a yeah, ball? Yeah. And he was like, I'd love to have a like because my dad left. Yeah. And so, so like, yeah, he is the Marine One of helicopter parents. <laughs> he is too involved. <laughs> and he's become his own sort of branding machine. I mean, it's amazing to me yeah. in this day and age that the guy's on wrestling. Like, I wish I could do what LeVar Ball did. <laughs> Um, I wish life, I could. I wish sure. I could be important and basically just be training kids on the side, like and have no. <laughs> uh, you know, you got your formal education at Cal State Dominguez or Stanislaus State. I don't know what it was, but you know, <laughs> you were scored two points a game. I look. I'm more entertained by him, except when he goes over the top. I look at this. I don't think you have the conversation with Lavar Ball. You just let him keep no, running. No, I life. think you have a conversation with Lonzo, and you say, Ask him to and you say, Lonzo. Them. No, I don't even say. That. I say, Lonzo. I don't really care what your dad says anymore. 
I don't really care what you are. I just don't want you to listen to him. <laughs> you're, you're your own man. You're your own man. Well, and, you get, and you need to filter. You want him to be his and own you, man. And you need to filter out what he's saying. And you need to believe that this is your employer. And, you're, and I'm not saying get rid of your family. I'm not saying this isn't hoop dreams. I'm not the coach uh, Pingator mm -hmm. telling you to get you know, William Gates. You don't need your family. No. I'm saying you need to block. You, you're a grown man now. And your father has too much influence everywhere. And, you know, I wouldn't even pay any attention to his quotes anymore. Laugh at him. And he goes, and, they'll, and Levant Lonzo will say, I already do. <laughs> and I already do. But, but I do think there's like, that's the only person I worry about him corrupting. I used to worry about him corrupting any of Steve Alford's recruits, but that doesn't matter because they're all gone. They're not going to UCLA anymore. See, I wonder if LeVar... Like, is he that harmful? I, He's I, only as harmful as you let him be. Well, m maybe. I mean, like, when he says, now, maybe he's just joking. but Or maybe he's just blowing smoke. Yeah. But when he says Lonzo will leave the Lakers if they don't sign LiAngelo and LaMelo, that could be messing with the bottom line. Well, I do That's sign Le I do sign LiAngelo and LaMelo. <laughs> I sign them as... Um, gate attendants in front of the <laughs> Staples Center. I just tell them that it's an NBA contract. I don't really give them the, I don't give them the chance to actually run the floor with my players. Are you kidding me? Lonzo Ball, this like, make him I'm the saying. ball boy. That's he's that, still got braces. Hire, doesn't hire he still have, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't LaMelo still have braces? I mean, come on. He does. No he NBA does. player I know has braces. <laughs> stop it already, LaVar, stop it. God, I'm so tired of him. <laughs> He's got to. He's got to do something. No, it just it cracks me up. Like, do you think even Jeannie Buss, uh, like she's back there going, God, how are we gonna fit Lamelo and Leangelo under the cap? It's just it's gonna be tough if we're gonna get Paul George. I mean, come on, they're not. They're not. They're not no dad is they're telling him. About if my, God, my dad rest his soul. If I wish he had the power to just say. You need to sign Mike Wines. He sucks, but you need to sign him. <laughs> like, uh, like, come on. You're going to listen to that guy? What do you think about Adam Silver's brought up? We've been talking about the playoffs yeah. and the Cavs getting there. Uh, Adam Silver brought up changing the format. Potent, you know, top eight teams in each conference still, but you would seed them one through 16. So, for instance, I don't know who's the eighth seed in the East right now. The number one seed is Houston. So Houston would play uh, whoever the eighth seed is in the East, not the West. What do you think about that? <sighs> that's a, that's a four-game series. Um, <laughs> I, I got a better idea. Why don't you just contract the Eastern Conference and take two of the teams and put them in the West? Because <laughs> the Eastern Conference doesn't matter. It, it hasn't doesn't. mattered in a while. Got one Cleveland team that is matters. the only thing that makes the Eastern Conference matter. Now, Boston, yes, they're interesting. But they're they haven't got to they're a, you know, they, I'd like to see them with a healthy Gordon Hayward. Um, I predicted the Wizards would go to the finals at the first of this season, and that's because... You predicted Washington would yes, beat Cleveland? Yes, I did. Not, yes, I did. I predicted Washington would beat Cleveland. Wow. And I did it because I'm um, an abject homer, and I don't know where, <laughs> and, and I'm from. I, I'm and I'm, say, and like, I've lived on. in the D.C. area for 14 years, and I'm just tired, and the Wizards haven't won anything so since So you wrote a column. Did you write a column? No, no you, but you I did go on ESPN.com. I was the only person that put the Wizards in there, and they were all making fun of me. <laughs> you really and, believed it? Or you just were... I just thought just it was wide open. Different. I thought Isaiah Thomas... So you was, thought Cleveland had really fallen off, obviously. Well, and I thought that Isaiah Thomas was going to be hurt for a lot of the season. I did think he'd fit in better. And I just thought that the Kyrie thing was really going to hurt him. And I didn't, think, I didn't think Boston or Cleveland was going to develop the chemistry they needed within a year okay. to get back to the finals with, the, with their roster changes. And I, and I based it on... I know it, was a, you know it wasn't that bright, but I based it on that Miami team that LeBron went to in 2011. Like, yep. they they were just they were a year away from getting over the you know getting getting to the NBA yep. finals when they got beat by Dallas which they shouldn't have yep. I mean but but they were a year away and once they got there it, it was lights out you know they won two yep. they lost one um, but so I thought that it would take them a little longer I don't think that anymore I don't if, to your original question about one through sixteen I the couple reasons I don't like it, this idea one. Adam Silver got that idea from Bill Simmons. <laughs> Bill Simmons would have to get royalties. <laughs> Bill Simmons is richer than any sports writer in America. <laughs> That's the truth. He needs to, he needs to start a fund for sports writers at this point. <laughs> and secondly, uh, and secondly, but in all sincerity, I think the biggest problem with the NBA playoffs, Chris, and I don't know if you agree with me, is 
Um, the stars, the best players, I like to see them late into May and June, or Healthy. as far as you can. If and their teams, hurt. too. When Russell Westbrook and the Thunder were knocked out, I was denied of the most exciting, dynamic player of the last year that had won the MVP. And he, he, went, from, he went from going, whatever it was, six or seven games with the Warriors, yep, uh, with, when he had KD yep. on his team, to five games, or whatever it was when they got knocked out against... Game four or five, four, five, five, I guess. Five. And and so Houston. yeah, and I was just kind of, I was just kind of wait a minute. So so to me, I like I don't I don't work. If you're going to go one through sixteen, you're going to completely de delegitimize the idea of the Eastern and Western Conference. And the travel thing is one thing, but it just there's a reason you have the geography you do because these teams are in the East, these yeah. teams are in the West. If you're going to just say there is no champion of the East and West anymore, and you're just going to take the 16 best teams, you you, you might as well just take the conference affiliations you would have to off get of rid them. Of the conferences, yeah. Which I, like I do like the idea of of one through 16, even with the travel. Yeah. Yeah. They're so let's say Orlando had to play it, it, Portland. It, 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 Orlando yeah. played Portland in the first round. You could spread. Or, and you're a B rider. You're a couple. B rider covering that 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 thing. And you're you're you're. It's a two two one one yeah, one yeah, series. Yeah. yeah, I'd be fine with it. Your paper wouldn't send you. They're hurting in their media coverage. A lot of papers aren't sending people anyway. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> right but that. I I. I Look, you could spread this playoffs out a little yeah. bit longer. You already get two games, in, two days in yeah. a lot of these series between games. And, you know, they're flying charter flights. And we wouldn't be. The media wouldn't be. Right. But they would be. And that your point, though, is well taken because the league obviously does want the newspapers at these games. And so the, that's something they and do the consider. Side, the digital sites and the, um, uh, the the guys who do their own handheld yeah. now. I mean, yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm, compete I'm, I'm competing against guys who essentially got these little cameras that they handhold now. Yeah. Guys like 16, didn't even go to J <laughs> school. He's like, he's, he's breaking some story that my boss is calling me about. Right. Going, why, why didn't you have what Billy Johnson had from, you know, like, <laughs> Billy Johnson's 15. <laughs> He didn't know what news is. He just recorded LeBron James <laughs> yelling profanity at Dr. Laura. Oh, oh God. But, but, that, yeah, but I do agree with it. I could get rid of the conferences, yeah. even out the schedule. So you basically have each team playing. Most teams you'd play three times, but some you'd only play twice. You know, and so everybody has an even schedule because it's not even you're now. A big, you're a bigger visionary than yeah, I am. Yeah, I'm, I'm, that's I'm what I'm looking I, at. I and then one old, through sixteen. I'm too old and too <laughs> too too steeped in that those conference championships meant something. But also, I do think I remember back in the day when we were kids, and well, you were a kid, I wasn't, but you know, <laughs> Magic and Bird played each other. Oh yeah. The reason they went two three two was that. because. Bird and Magic were tired of doing two, two, one, one at the finals. At some point, like back and forth. Yeah, back and forth. But remember, so they were doing also that, flying commercial back then. Okay, well, this is true, but still, I mean, two, two, one, one, and you're looking at the let's say the Wizards uh, versus the Clippers it in the could first be a round. Long, yeah, you could have some long flights. Long flights. You're by the time your finals, you don't even know what time zone you're in. You're jet lagged. It's like you went to. Australia three times and back. But don't you think you see? I just think the West is so much better than the East. Now this year it's a little Which closer. Which goes back to my ever. point: contract the East <laughs> and make get it, rid make, of them all. It, it, do we they, really they need, need to do something? Yeah. Do we they really don't need to? Do I mean, we really okay, need the Nets? But I'd like. What has the Nets won other than Dinwiddie this weekend? What have the Nets won Nothing. lately? No. Jason Kidd when he got to the finals. Right. A couple years. That was it. Do we you need know? the Nets as a franchise? <laughs> Barkley Center <laughs> books concerts. It books fights. You don't need a basketball That's team. Need. That's all they need. Well, I'm kidding, New Jersey. I don't know. Oh, I don't Brooklyn. know if he is or not. I don't know if he is or not. <laughs> I don't know Who, where it is. Who's your MVP right now? Who's Are you a voter? M no, I'm not. And it's who, who, crazy because they should give a vote. You to should me. be a voter. Yeah, I know. Who, who's I'm hurt? Well, I remember the New York Times didn't let. Their writers vote for a while. Yeah, yeah they, well, they don't, do they, do I don't they let know if them they now? do now. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know, know if either. I voted in when the Washington I was at the Post. Times. I didn't either. I started no one's asked yeah. me. Um, but I think <laughs> if they did, like you just did, and I appreciate that, is I would, I mean, right now, James Harden. Yeah. I mean, and, and so and you I agree? Know, is, we know LeBron's the best player in the world, yeah. but you don't just give it it's to the like, best yeah, player. Yeah, it's in like world. you could have given it to Michael Jordan exactly. every year. Like you, I heard you say that earlier in Like it makes sense. Like, like James Harden, and, and and this is why. Last year, to me, the, Lebr the the MVP to me is the wow person. Not just the person with the numbers, but the person that you remember like, damn, that was either a highlight or a game. 
That game. Well, how much did he? How many did he, the, the triple double he had? Fifty. 60. Yeah. I think it was the first 60 point triple double that in the NBA. That was insane. I went I, I just went and yes. watched the game after the fact and I just watch it and I go, "My goodness. Yeah. This is special." Larry Bird scored 60 once in his career. Larry Bird, you know, greatest it small wasn't a forward that I can think of in his after a, LeBron. He, he didn't it wasn't a triple double. Yeah. It was yeah, he's the greatest small forward after LeBron I can think yeah. of. Larry Bird has 60 points one game. James Harden did that. A triple Damn. double, and then, and to me that's that's the same kind of wow factor Russell Westbrook gave me last year. Mm -hmm. And so if you, if, if the Rockets and you're on a great team too, yep. to me it has something. You you cannot be a third place team and win. You know the MVP. I don't think you should. And uh, and well, that, Westbrook last year. I know, and was, I what, and I made it, and seven? I made a um, exception. I, yeah, for I made him. an exception because it's triple him. double. Yeah. No, just because he would have cried because he's still upset about KD <laughs> not being there. But and I didn't want him to get any more emotionally <laughs> damaged because Russ, we need him in this league. But but the other one, uh, you know, like like and then Kyrie, man, I, are you gonna call? I mean, Kyrie was sort of my front runner early. He's I, balling. He was, he was right up there I, early. Man, I still like Kyrie. I, I I don't think there's anyone close to Harden right now. No, you're right. You know, I mean, I, I think, think Durant I think and Steph kind of cancel each other out. Yeah. LeBron had the horrible month in January. Kyrie, they're 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 only playing. They're like 18 and 15 over the last two months. Yeah, no, so they're struggling a little yeah, bit. It's, yeah. Hopefully, Harden continues to play well, or it's really gonna get interesting. Yeah, you know. Yeah. What, did, did, you trimmed think his, did you see ever, he trimmed his beard? For did he the trim game? last it looked, night? You look like it. Yeah, because usually you can out. hide snacks in it and eat during the game. <laughs> it's like crazy. It's like crazier than Bill Walton's beard used to be. Like Walton he, had a crazy yeah, beard too. Yeah, and so. Um, but did anyway. you ever think we see a tri anybody average a triple double again? No, I didn't. No, I didn't. And, be, and it wasn't because um, that. It wasn't because Oscar Robertson was one of a kind, which he is. It was it was because um, everybody is so into specialty nowadays. I mean, Dennis Rodman went to the Hall of Fame because he could He's rebound. Yeah. He couldn't shoot. Yeah. You could shoot better than Dennis yeah, Rodman. I think I could. Yeah, and, <laughs> but but but, there was, but it just became such a specialty league. Like yeah. there would be a lock. You'd have a lockdown Bruce defender. Bowen, yeah, you'd have a lockdown. Like you know, you'd have ben a lockdown Wallace. defender. Yeah. Ray Allen became a great shooter. Well, he was all around, but but he became a great yeah. shooter, and so. I never thought you would get a guy that was like so, other than like a LeBron, so multidimensional that was just, and, and, and his size too. It's incredible. Like how many times have we gone to the playground when we actually could play back in the day and you'd meet a guy and he was like the same size as Russ Westbrook or John Starks and you went, you went, wait a minute, that dude just jumped out of the gym. How did he not get to the NBA and this guy did? And to me there's like this demarcation line mm -hmm. that somehow those guys got over it in some way. And to me it's amazing. Like I celebrate guys like that every day. Like John Stark should have been working at a Piggly Wiggly in Oklahoma. He even says it himself. And yet, <laughs> and yet he forged. And he was, he, wasn't he? He was. <laughs> and he forged an NBA career yeah. out of heart. You know, and, heart, and I think a lot of, everybody says, oh, Russell Westbrook's athleticism. Hell, I mean, yeah, okay. When he goes up, that's hard, man. Yeah. When he goes up, that he just dunks angrily. Yep, yep. So I'm, I'm awesome. glad you brought up Starks because you covered Patrick Ewing when yeah. he was with the Knicks. Do you think he was as good as Akeem Olajuwon? And if they had won that series, yeah. if the Knicks had beaten Houston in seven versus Houston beating the Knicks in seven, do you think people would look at Ewing as better than Olajuwon? No, because... Elijah Wan was more effective. Um, the, the, the older he got, he was almost more effective. His and, footwork, his the footwork, defense, and everything. And while Patrick moves. willed himself into what I consider the the greatest jump shooting center in the history of the game. Almost, mm -hmm. I I don't think anybody had his range. Akeem was close, but Patrick could shoot it yeah. from eighteen with yeah. consistency. Um, I think that you know he he had some injury problems late. Um, Hakeem retired at the wrong time, right time, and he won two titles. Yeah. And so I, you know, if if Patrick had won two titles and Hakeem never got uh, Hakeem never got one, I would say that. But you know, look, he's, I mean, he's still. Uh, he's Pat, Patrick's there. in my top ten, top yeah, yeah. seven centers of all time. Um, but uh, he can live with being. He can be live with being considered worse than <laughs> Elijah Wan. Now I mentioned you had covered the team when Jeff Van Gundy was coach. When you see Van Gundy on TV now to call in these games, are you surprised? I mean, when I covered him, I followed yeah. you. I covered him 
and he was, we never, we rarely, if ever, saw that side of Jeff. He was always miserable. He was always serious. Yeah. You know, every loss was a moral catastrophe for the team. But yeah. doesn't that, but do you, do you but, think that's more about Van Gundy or the coaching profession? Because I look, for instance, at, um, God, who was it? Um, Doug Collins. Yes. Doug Collins. That's, like, oh, yeah. Doug that's Collins. A good point. Heavenly analyst. Hellish coach. He was miserable. Like the dude, yeah. like like he and he would get angry and he would, die, and he with would like loss. die with every loss. And I also think when we went back to Jim Dolan, like like he was Jeff was working in a septic tank for a long time. He, do you remember the you remember the the uh, oh you guys would have loved this. He had a framed um, saying on his wall in his coaching office at SUNY Purchase. It said, "If you think everyone is against you, you're, you're um, let's see." You're not paranoid. You're perceptive. <laughs> that's what his whole that was his that, that was, was his, his model, yeah, yeah it was his his that mantra his manager, in yeah. New York, and and now he's sort of like like if I'm him, I would never go back to coaching. I've I don't care what they said, pay me. He looks happy. Exactly. I've always said, look, he can do what he want once, but I've always said I thought it was best for him never to go back to coaching. Yeah. Why he, would you? He seems so much happier, and he's funny, and he you know he's good on TV. Him and Mark Jackson I love are great. Him. Yeah. So, so. Uh, what? what is, you wrote a book about Shaq. Yeah. What was it called? It was called Shaq Talks Back. It was, an, it was the New York Times bestseller. I, it was basically, I ghost wrote Shaq's autobiography for him. It was, I could write a book about the 10 days I spent with Shaquille O'Neal in 2000 <laughs> in Orlando. I mean, stuff you would, you would laugh your butt off. It would never got in the book. I was going to say, yeah. tell us something that would shock us or we don't know about Shaq. Oh, well, just the whole... That you can't tell. Well, you know he's a hunter, right? Yes, you yes, know, and somewhat. I, he, he t I've been in his house where he right. has all the animals on the wall. But he told me they just send them out there. It's basically like, it's not real hunting, right? No, it's real hunting. It, he went, look at this. The last day of the book, like, he goes, he goes, yo, bro, and he goes, I go, yeah, what's up, Shaquille? And he goes, um... He goes, uh, I want to celebrate the end of the book. You know, you're doing all the interviews. I'm going, oh, oh, that's great. And he goes, and I just hear this, boo, 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 boo. a chopper lands on his front lawn, you know, <laughs> and some guy that is a Vietnam tail gunner comes out and he goes, hey, Shaq, come on in. And Shaquille O'Neal and his friends get all these guns. I mean, he's got like this full on guns and they go to some private hunting lodge in Frostproof, Florida, where like, I mean, it was out in the sticks. And, you know, first of all, I got to sit in the back of the helicopter so <laughs> and Shaq is like, Shaq, He's like, oh, I don't got enough room, bro. And he throws his legs over me, and I'm just like this in the back of the helicopter. <laughs> and then he puts on the headphones, and while we're going around the Everglades, he starts doing the theme from Magnum P.I., like, din -in -din -in -din -in -din -din. <laughs> like, just a big kid. And then we get out of the helicopter, and this guy, I swear to God, I don't know what the guy's name was, but he's got all camo on. He's got, and, and uh, am I allowed to swear on this? Or no. Yeah, we'll be, they'll beep it out. All right. but, and so, he goes so. at one point, at one point, like, and he gets out and like, there's only white people at this thing, right? There's only yeah. white people with camouflage. And he just, he, and, the, and, the, and the hunting lodge guy looks at him and goes, Shaq, you a biggin', son! And then all of a sudden, it went from there, and we walk in, and, and Shaquille looks at the wall, and all the guys who got the you know pictures, trophy yeah, pictures yeah, of their yeah. kill, up. Or he goes, he goes, look at this. He goes, I'm the only brother here ever. And then, <laughs> ever. And then there's one point where he actually goes out and shoots this like rare caribou deer. And I'm not a hunter. I like yeah, to yeah. go fishing, and I'm like kind of a little squeamish. And he goes, come on out with me. And he like literally from a high parallel, from a long ways away, hits this deer. Really. And I will give him this. The whole hunting lodge, they give any animals that aren't taken, they, they, they basically give the, um, give the animals and uh, they're, they're used as food for grow your own charities and stuff. But it, either way, he hits this and it's, it's not dead. And, and the hunting guy gets out of the Jeep and he's like, Shaq, I'll get him for you. Don't worry, put him out of misery. And all of a sudden, you remember the scene in Matrix where Keanu Reeves goes, sir, do you have any metal on? And he's just got like 18 guns like strapped. Yeah, yeah, like that. Yeah. Shaq takes off his vest and he goes, I got it. And he's got all these Shaq guns. Did that. Yeah, and he's got all these guns. Like he's like Keanu Reeves in the Matrix. <laughs> and he takes out this huge gold gun. And it's, uh, you know, whatever, a desert eagle or something. And the guy looks at it and he goes, Shaq, 
that's a homeboy special, boy. Like, <laughs> and, it, you, the, the, and, and Shaq, like, he didn't care that they were rednecks. He had fun with yeah, them. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. you know, he, and, and then he came up with some screenplay where, hey, write up a screenplay where I get kid, some guy gets kidnapped and he's the son of a military guy. And, and, and then he tricks out one of these Jeeps with rims and they got music and they go, wait, who did we kidnap? Oh, no. And I go, Shaq, I go, it's, it's been done. It's called Rambo, okay? You know, like, like, but it was, you couldn't make it up. The oh, whole, that's, that's great he still stuff. gives me a hard time too that oh he didn't want to go hunting he just wanted to go fishing <laughs> let me ask you this yeah. Shaq and Kobe Shaq, the Shaq Kobe Lakers yeah. against today's Golden State Warriors who wins um, gosh if they played with those rules Shaq Kobe Lakers that inside outside game was so debilitating who would guard Shaq no, they, there's no way I mean yeah you could say Shaq, who would yeah. guard Steph who would guard but that that this game that Steph has created and I really do think this launch from the parking lot you know I'm open when I leave the womb I mean <laughs> that, it's amazing to me but that wasn't the game then no if you totally played was. this if you played this stop and pop game I, I probably like Steph. I mean, I really so you think, think it's. I mean, people always I think say it's, predicated this. it's really on, two different games. Yeah, I think rules. it's predicated on how that ga- how that game is officiated, how that game is played. If Shaquille O'Neal could emasculate Dikembe Mutombo like, like he did, did in the 2001 yeah. NBA Finals, um, I, how could you possibly stop that? The, 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 you're, you're looking at the weirdest thing I saw last year was, and this I think it was during the NBA Finals, the Conference Finals. Stephen Curry was going on the court on the left side, and Kevin Durant was ahead of the pack. Chris, he had a layup. He had a lay- This is basketball 101. You give oh, yeah. it to the man with a dunk or a layup. Steph Curry pulled up from three, and Kevin Durant was like, yeah, we got three instead of two. That never happened in our yeah, lifetime. Yeah. It was like the new, uh, it was like a new world of thinking about basketball, and, and that, that, that beca- that, the fact that that three-pointer from 25 feet away became automatic to Steph Curry and he, in, a, in, a, in a groove, and that that was more important than Kevin Durant scoring a uh-huh. layup underneath. It, to me, it said, wow, this is a different game we're playing now. No, nah, that's, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'll see a Tristan Thompson or a Zaza Pachulia, somebody get a re, either get a rebound yeah. or a pass, and they're right there under the basket, and they kick it out to somebody for a three-point oh. shot. I'm like, look, I understand you aren't the greatest offensive scorer, but any you can lay the ball up and yeah. they kick it out for a three. Yeah, it's a different world. It's almost no like question. they're going by the saber metrics of the whole thing. Like I three oh, for yeah. two yeah, every time. And, and if we got a good three point shooter out there, let's give it to him. And it blows me away every time because it it messes with my mind. Like they they've legislated the big man out of the game yeah. almost. Yeah. They basically said, you know, can you imagine like a Benoit Benjamin? He wouldn't even no, get in the G not, League now. There's no way. You have to be great. To be, yeah, you know and you're right. And a Shaq, though, see, uh, most of the big men can't punish you enough, right? Where, right. They, where they'll, you'll, where you have to say, you know what? Even though they're only scoring two, it's still too much. Even though we're getting three, Shaq could do that. Yes. and that's the difference. Yeah. Mike Wise. Great uh, job, man. Great story. I thought this Enjoyed was going to be like a five-minute podcast. <laughs> I like told my life story. No, that was awesome. My man, Thank Mike you, Wise, man. New York Times, Washington Post, the undefeated. Great journalist. Glad we had you. Oh, in the man. Zone. It's great to see you doing so well. And I know your family. I yes. know your life. And um, I'll say you. My I, girls are in college now. It's crazy, yeah. I'll just tell you, you what Muhammad Ali babies. once said to Cosell. I like your show. I like your style. <laughs> but please don't call me for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Chris. We'll sign off on that yeah. note. <laughs>